So I received a tremendous amount of feedback from subscribers and from new folks uh, to the channel. Uh, when I uh, did the 150 in one part one, um, it seemed like everybody had a story to tell about either this kit or something similar to it. And I even heard from the family of the engineer and ham that designed the 150 in one for Tandy. So Radio Shack was looking for uh, this type of product and looking at everything that was out there. They had somebody put together uh, this 150 in one. Uh, for the, uh, the mid-70s. As you all know, sometimes magic happens on this channel, and I receive some critical historic detail about my subject from the comments. It turns out that the man who designed the 150 in one kit has two sons who are subscribers to this channel. They gave me some inside info. The 150 in one designer turns out to be a ham radio operator. W9SIA Franklin Swan Sr., still living according to one of his sons at age 92. This is the man who converted the Japanese version starting with the 80 in 1 and then the 150 in 1, built by the Japanese Gakken Holdings Company. Gakken was founded in 1947 by Hidito Furukawa. W9SIA Franklin was both a writer and a ham experimenter. Here's an example of his kind of thinking. This one's for 73 Magazine, November 1983. He cleverly synthesizes solid state equivalents of vacuum tubes. He also contributed to the ARRL publications, including Hints and Kinks, and for other publications. Rights to the electronic toy produced in Japan by Gakken had presumably been obtained by Tandy, and the kit had to be transformed into English for the North American market. According to his sons, he was a contractor working for Tandy. He drew or drafted the schematics with some help from one of the sons, who was in his teens at the time. Obviously, there was a lot of checking and testing which had to occur to make the kit viable. Here's a quote from one of the kids. If I remember correctly, the guy who worked on the 201 started with my father's work and just expanded on it. I remember him contacting my father for ideas. My father was a contractor working for Tandy, and the guy who made the 201 was a full-time employee. I've found that working with this system, once you get beyond about 10 wires, get up to 15 wires, it starts to get very complicated to figure out what you're really doing. And when you go as far as I have with this, with uh, uh, doing a full regenerative receiver with two stages of audio amplification, uh, the amount of wires goes right through the roof. And uh, it's, it's very difficult to document, much less get something that actually works. So uh, I uh, promised I would introduce five new circuits. Of course, the first one was the wireless broadcaster that we did in the last video. Uh, but we're going to be doing uh, four new ones in this video, and these are beyond uh, the circuits that are in the original book. So I'm trying to do them in the same style as the book, however, the guidebook that goes with 150 and 1, so you can attempt to uh, try some of these new circuits I've come up with. It can be a bit frustrating when you're putting these things together and trying to get it to work, and especially when you have NPN and PNP transistors together. And I did have to do a circuit where two of the PNPs were acting as the amplifier and the NPN transistor was acting as the detector. So it's challenging to get the power supply to work with both transistors at the same time. So if you didn't see uh, Project 151, uh, which is the wireless broadcaster, take a look at the first video before uh, going on in this video. I'm using the 150 in one kit as my broadcast transmitter from Mars. So the more that you mess with the 150 in one project kit, the more chance you're going to break something. And I've just lost another 0.05 capacitor. Notice that this ceramic disc capacitor is larger than the other components, so it tends to wobble back and forth. And eventually with oxidation 
and weakening uh, of the leads, they simply snap off. Now fortunately, it's very easy to change these capacitors, and I've replaced it already with a modern mylar or metal film type capacitor. And uh, if you have problems, you might just as well go ahead and shotgun out all of the parts and replace them with modern fresh parts. That way you won't have as many problems on the bottom with the leads breaking. So just about every project that involves a receiver or some type of tone amplification is going to require a power amplifier stage. And it's unfortunate that this kit did not have something like an LM386 on board, which is a general purpose power amplifier. But, um, as you can see in my old notebook from 10th grade, um, there's a couple power amplifier styles that are fairly popular that you can build with transistors. One is the classic push-pull amplifier. This is found in most of the pocket radios of the 1960s through early 80s. And the other is the Class A type power amplifier that basically drives a speaker with a single transistor, single-ended Class A it's called. So I did try to do a push-pull amplifier, but of course the first problem you run into is these two transistors, the 2SA and the 2SB style, are not identical. They have different gains. One is meant for audio, one is meant for RF converters, so it wouldn't make a good push-pull amplifier. So instead, we're going to do the single-ended style, and I've done some modifications to the circuit. It'll be a two-transistor amplifier, and it'll have similar characteristics to an LM386, and it'll be able to drive a speaker off a simple crystal radio or some other type of receiver, or off a, uh, a computer output or a, some type of disc player. It'll have enough gain to drive the speaker. So this power amplifier, this audio power amplifier, represents uh, Project 152. Project 152 will be a general purpose power amplifier. So have a little mercy on me here uh, with the actual wiring sequence and the wires drawn on the plaque. The schematic, of course, is correct, but I didn't spend a lot of time working on the documentation. There might be some errors. So the final transistor, the 2SB54, 52, 53, or whatever, has a dissipation of around 200 milliwatts. So you don't want to run it that high. I'm running this one at a little over 5 milliamps standing current. 5 milliamps is not going to be over dissipation. I wouldn't go too much higher than 7 milliamps standing current, but it seems like the, uh, the 50K pot and the 47K resistor bias the transistor properly. I wouldn't go any further with that. Getting good output. The sine wave looks pretty good. Let's take a look at the sine wave. Really not too bad. So it's going to be okay. I think this will give us some bench top volume for our various projects. A little two transistor power amp. That's what happens when you go a little too far. So also, don't be afraid to hook it up to a real speaker. A larger speaker, even a 5-inch speaker in a nice cabinet, is going to give a lot more output. Then the little tiny one that comes with the kit. But use what you got. So I'm using the input coupling coil feature on the ferrite loop stick uh, to full advantage. It's a coax fed long wire antenna and uh, this is a serious uh, antenna for a crystal set attached to a two transistor amplifier and we should get good results.
was set to address Congress at a time when the country's strong alliance with the U.S. has been tested by the war in Gaza. Thousands of protesters are outside the Capitol. People are angry. I think people are sorrowful. I think people are rageful. Uh, I've been month and month of genocide. Congress next hour. Benjamin Netanyahu believes there is broad cross-party support for his country's war on Hamas. But while Republicans who invited the Israeli Prime Minister... America's listening to Fox News. Okay, so basically I've hooked up the crystal radio section of the 150 and 1 consisting of the ferret loop stick primary, which is connected to the ground and the antenna, the secondary, which has a center tap that's going to a germanium diode, and the germanium diode goes directly to the 22K resistor on the input of our two-stage amplifier. And as you can hear, uh, with two very close stations, we have all kinds of volume. Not very good selectivity. Fortunately, the two stations are at opposite ends of the band, and we can pick up both of them nicely. But I don't expect to have very good selectivity, especially at night. But it does prove that even this simple two-transistor germanium amplifier has all kinds of volume. So I was pretty sure that there were components to do some type of oscillator, but I was not sure if I could actually hit 455 kilohertz. Okay, I've got the 455 kilohertz BFO breadboarded. Seems very stable. It's tunable. Now it tunes pretty fast, of course. But once set, you would not be touching that again using the secondary of the tuning coil as the output so it's a nice low impedance output and I've got a 0 0.001 or a thousand puff coupling capacitor off the coupling link that should go right in to feed almost any kind of product detector so simply using this BFO with any simple receiver would allow you to uh, come up with a circuit that you could further develop on a printed circuit board. Now I put an extra 100 picofarads across the tuning capacitor in order to reach this lower frequency and the, uh, the output looks like a pretty pure sine wave. Okay, project 155 is the moonshot. This is the one that gave me some trouble and is it a jumbled mess of wires? But this is it folks a regenerative receiver on the 150 and one So this is uh, my attempt at the regen. I've rearranged the parts and I've used a 50k pot down here. This is a 50k pot I've added. This adjusts the voltage on the detector and I'm only using about one volt out of the available nine volts which tells you that there is excess feedback from the Armstrong uh, feedback system, the tickler coil. Now I did try to reduce that by putting the 100 ohm resistor across that directly and that did help. It brought me up in voltage a little bit. I uh, of course was using that 100 ohm as the decoupling resistor and uh, I'm now using a 2.2k resistor as a decoupling and of course that doesn't really have much effect on anything when you're talking about a 50k pot feeding the first stage adding 2.2k brings the voltage down a little bit maybe influences the bias in a minor way
one in this. Anyway, it is regenerating. It's not great. I don't have a lot of volume out of the speaker, but I can tell you that uh, we do have a regenerative receiver. Uh, this haywire, of course, with no ground plane, is not the ideal way to make a regen. The other type of regen we could possibly look at is the Hartley style, using the center tap. But the problem here is, again, we have way excess feedback since it's a center tap. In, uh, say, 100 turns of wire, you only need to have about maybe 20 of them that are part of the, uh, the tap, the center tap. Uh, not 50, <laughs> as this thing is. So uh, we'll run into the same problem. The detector will want to go into oscillation uh, immediately. I've reduced the throttle capacitor to the lowest value I can, which is uh, 100 picofarads. And uh, that fixed 100 picofarads did help a little bit on the regeneration, but um, you'd like to go even lower. Now, unlike the crystal set, which requires a long wire antenna and grounding system. I am able to pick up stations out here, into the earphone at least, with just the ferrite loop stick. Once I add about 20 feet of wire like I have here, you can start to hear some stations out of the speaker. Let's turn it on and see if we can hear a station. But we are doing it here on the porch with a 20-foot piece of wire, no ground. The regenerative receiver, of course, has much more gain than the crystal set. So I hope you guys enjoyed part two of the 150 and one electronic project kit. This really was a, uh, a groundbreaking type of uh, system to teach young people about electronics. And it paid off for a whole generation of technicians, engineers, physicists, and scientists that uh, benefited directly from an educational toy like the 150 and one.